Cappadocia, 318 BC. Eumenes of Cardia was under siege, trapped in a lonely and desolate fortress called Nora. Nestled amidst the hills of Cappadocia, Nora sat securely atop a rocky crag that punched up from the ground. He was safe here for the time being, but already the noose had been drawn tight around him. For Eumenes was a man on the run, marked for death by the Macedonian army. The siege had dragged on for a year, and it showed no signs of letting up. He had made several attempts to breach the blockade, each ending in failure. It seemed that Eumenes was at the end of his tether, but fate had other ideas. Two messages would soon be racing towards the Greek general. One came from the most powerful man in Europe, the other from the most powerful man in Asia. Both will ask for the same thing, an alliance. So how did this come to be? Why were two of the world's most powerful men seeking the friendship of a Greek with only 600 soldiers to his name? To answer these questions, we must go back, back to when Alexander the Great still ruled the world. The turbulent life of Eumenes of Cardia was one long roller coaster from start to finish, but his humble origins gave little indication of how far he would eventually rise. Born in Cardia, a Greek city in Thrace, circa 362 BC, he was resourceful, cunning, and charismatic, all features that would come to the fore during the wars for Alexander's empire. Ironically, Eumenes' first big break would come when his city was conquered. In 338, Cardia was swallowed up by the rising power of Macedon during the reign of its expansionist king, Philip II. His kingdom now held sway over much of the Balkans, and in order to administer his new lands, he expanded the Macedonian bureaucracy with more royal secretaries. Among these secretaries was none other than Eumenes himself, tasked with managing Macedonia's growing pile of paperwork. Philip was then dramatically assassinated in 336 BC, leading to his young son Alexander taking the throne. The rest, as they say, is history. Alexander spent the next 13 years conquering the known world, marching thousands of miles through distant lands, fighting exotic enemies, and destroying the most powerful empire the world had yet seen. And for each step Alexander took, Eumenes, his personal secretary, was never far behind, accompanying his magnetic king every step of the way. Despite his later military fame, Eumenes held no military positions for most of the campaign, making him a target for mockery in Alexander's military-minded court. For Eumenes, however, it wasn't just his lack of military experience that drew mockery, for he was a Greek in a Macedonian world. Long story short, the Greeks and the Macedonians were kindred peoples, both speaking the same language and following the same gods. Nevertheless, there was mutual snobbishness from both sides, with the Greeks looking down upon the Macedonians, and the Macedonians being generally content to return the favour. Throughout his career, Eumenes' authority among the Macedonians would be hampered by his Greekness, although he often overcame this through his resourcefulness and charm. Clearly, Alexander sensed this innate talent inside Eumenes, and as they returned west, the secretary was appointed to command a prestigious cavalry unit. Once the king returned to Babylon, he began preparations for a new campaign. They were not to be. On the 1st of June, 323, Alexander fell ill. By the 11th, he was dead, his plans for the future reduced to ash. Conflict soon broke out over what was to be done and who was to succeed him. The king had no clear successor, and during this initial struggle, Eumenes stayed on the sidelines, acting as an envoy between the warring factions. In the end, Alexander's most distinguished and senior officer, Perdiccas, established himself as the preeminent player, while it was decided that Alexander should be succeeded as king by his mentally disabled half-brother, Philip Aradeus, and his newborn son, Alexander IV. Since neither were capable of rule, a regency was established with Perdiccas at its head. Would he be able to stabilise such an unruly empire? With ambitious generals round every corner and rebellions rife, no one could be sure of the answer, but it would soon become apparent that, however this great game ended, Eumenes would have a major part to play. The regent's authority was shaky, and the task facing him Herculean. He now had to hold together Alexander's massive empire, and keep the many Macedonian generals in check. Soon enough, his ill-fated balancing act would tip over into war, and Eumenes would quickly find his fate inextricably linked to the regents. Perdiccas had many enemies, and few loyal or capable friends. So when the time came to share out the satrapies, the Persian term for provinces, of the empire, Eumenes was granted Cappadocia. For a Greek to be given control of a whole satrapy was unusual to say the least. Perdiccas had a dire need of people he could rely upon. Cappadocia was no measly province either. Its wildlands produced some of the finest cavalry in the ancient world, but it wasn't without its drawbacks. The main problem was that it wasn't actually under Macedonian control. Back during his conquests, Alexander hadn't dotted every I or crossed every T, allowing some Persian warlords to establish resistance movements. Most of Cappadocia was under the sway of the Persian noble Ariarathes, 
and Eumenes was tasked by the regent with defeating him. Trouble was that Eumenes, with most of his satrapy out of his hands, didn't have the resources to overpower Ariarathes. So Perdiccas ordered Eumenes' neighbouring satraps, namely Antigonus of Phrygia, to help him out. They refused. For a haughty Macedonian, the thought of being ordered to help a Greek like Eumenes would have been irritating enough, but this, for Antigonus, was not why he refused. No, as fate would have it, Antigonus and Eumenes were actually good friends. He just didn't like being bossed around. Ever since Alexander had left him to govern Phrygia in 334, Antigonus had gotten used to acting with almost no oversight. With his satraps in open defiance of him, Perdiccas had no choice but to come north himself, and he soon conquered Cappadocia. Despite the victory, this affair probably gave Perdiccas little cause for celebration. The limits of his power had been brutally exposed, and Antigonus had gotten off scot-free. It was while this was going on that Perdiccas continued to test his protege, and Eumenes was dispatched to restore order to Armenia, which he did with efficiency. Already Eumenes was proving himself a skilled tactician. He would need those skills, as Perdiccas soon found himself at war on two fronts. The region had thus far quashed troublesome regions in both east and west, following up his victory in Cappadocia with the subjugation of Pisidia in southwest Anatolia. So with things starting to go his way, he decided to flex his muscles. He ordered Antigonus to appear in Babylon at once to face trial. With this act, he hoped to smoke out his foe, but Antigonus was not prepared to go down without a fight, with grave consequences for both the regent and his protege. Antigonus on his own wouldn't have been a challenge, but in short order, Perdiccas alienated and offended the ruler of the European territories, a man named Antipater. Put shortly, Perdiccas was sworn to marry Antipater's daughter, but he also received a marriage offer from Cleopatra, the sister of Alexander the Great. Torn between the two, Perdiccas publicly promised to marry Antipater's daughter, but privately he told Cleopatra that he would marry her soon, believing that he could get a claim to the throne. Somehow, Antigonus got wind of this development and fled to Europe, where he told Antipater, who was understandably furious at this slimy act of wife juggling. The regent thus found himself at war in the west, facing off against Antigonus, Antipater, and Antipater's son-in-law, the legendary general Craterus. While to the south, Antipater sent letters to his other son-in-law, Ptolemy, the satrap of Egypt, seeking his support as well. Ptolemy was all too happy to oblige, and he made his position clear by sending men to capture Alexander's mobile tomb, as it rolled through Syria on its way back to Macedonia. The highway robbery of the king's corpse amounted to an open declaration of war on Perdiccas. The regent's regime now found itself caught between two fires, Antipater in Europe and Ptolemy in Egypt. After a council of war, Perdiccas himself hastened south to fight Ptolemy, leaving Eumenes to face off against an array of powerful generals by himself. The allies began making inroads in Anatolia. Antigonus had already returned to Phrygia to raise support there, while Antipater and Craterus secured the defection of the Perdican fleet, allowing them to cross the Hellespont. Eumenes quickly found his defence hamstrung. Alcatas and Neoptolemus, two generals Perdiccas had assigned to the region, refused to work alongside Eumenes the Greek. Alcatas outright refused, while Neoptolemus defected and faced Eumenes in a battle, which Eumenes won handily, absorbing his foe's army in the process. Neoptolemus fled to the Allies, who Eumenes now had to face alone. As it happened, the Allies decided to split their armies, Craterus and Neoptolemus would face Eumenes, Antipater would race south to box in Perdiccas, and Antigonus would conquer Cyprus. With one victory under his belt, Eumenes steeled himself for his greatest challenge yet, the legendary Craterus. Craterus was the true soldier's soldier. Gruff, bluff, and unyielding, he was worshipped by the Macedonian rank and file, and he was far above Eumenes in terms of prestige and personal magnetism. Eumenes knew this well, so out of fear that his men would simply defect, he didn't tell his army that they were fighting Craterus, but instead the treacherous Neoptolemus, as well as a barbarian warlord. Then, when the time for battle came, he collected all of his non-Greek cavalry and deployed it against Craterus. As the legendary general charged forth, he expected that his fame would cause the defection or flight of his foes. Unfortunately for him, these non-Greeks neither knew nor care who he was, and they set upon him furiously, killing him in the process. One down, one to go. Eumenes then sought out Neoptolemus, and slew him in personal combat. The battle was won shortly after. In his first major battle, the plucky Greek had overcome a legendary Macedonian. Nevertheless, Eumenes was pious in victory, and Craterus was interred with all honours. Friend or foe, Craterus was still a legend among men, and Eumenes could ill afford to offend his soldiers by despoiling his body. In this whirlwind war, Eumenes had learnt several important lessons. Firstly, he was certainly a first-rate general in the vein of Alexander himself, but he needed to be very careful when dealing with his Macedonian allies. 
The defection of both Neoptolemus and the Hellespontine fleet were inspired in part by the disgust at serving a Greek. Eumenes had stabilised the situation in Asia Minor, but his triumph would be short-lived as dark news arrived from Egypt. Perdiccas the regent was dead, murdered by his own men after a botched attempt to cross the Nile. His troops had gone over to his enemies, and worse still, the two kings had been captured. Suddenly Eumenes found himself defending a regime with no centre. The main beneficiaries of Perdiccas' downfall, Antipater and Antigonus, set about redividing the empire. Antipatus was confirmed as the supreme general in Europe and became regent. Antigonus was appointed supreme general of Asia. Ptolemy, meanwhile, kept Egypt. As for Eumenes, he was officially deprived of Cappadocia and declared an enemy of the state by the Macedonian army. With the whole empire now turned against him, he began ruthlessly plundering the Anatolian countryside, refilling his coffers and making his foes look like paper tigers. Antigonus and Antipater thus set out to defeat him and the remaining Perdican loyalists. And where they were concerned, the Perdicans were unable to form a united front, because once again the Macedonians disliked serving alongside a Greek. For the time being, Eumenes was on his own. Antipater, who was 81, tired of chasing after Eumenes, and left Antigonus to finish the job. The two generals eventually met in battle, and although Eumenes had a great advantage in cavalry, Antigonus bribed one of his officers to desert, so Eumenes was left stranded on the battlefield, and his army was crushed. From here, the slippery Greek dodged Antigonid patrols and ambushes, before finally being bottled up in the fortress of Nora. Eumenes still had some troops left, but he foresaw a long siege ahead, so he dismissed all bar 600 Cappadocian cavalry and settled down for a long siege. Despite being trapped, Eumenes was never inactive. He chatted with his soldiers, keeping them in high spirits, and made sure to keep his horses in good shape. The siege also gave him time to watch as his enemies began to fracture. Old man Antipater finally died in 319, but instead of selecting his son Cassander to replace him, he chose an officer called Polyperchon. Cassander was furious, and Europe collapsed into civil war. As for Antigonus, he and Eumenes had been old friends, and despite being official enemies, he was open to patching things up. The two men thus met at a parley, and Eumenes requested that he be restored to Cappadocia. Antigonus assented, and sent a messenger to Antipater for approval. They did not yet know of his death. While he awaited an answer, Antigonus left and destroyed the remaining Perdican loyalists in Pisidia. It was here that he learned of Antipater's death. Now that the grand old man was dead, Antigonus was not content to take orders from a second-rate regent like Polyperchon. He therefore decided to officially break with Polyperchon's regime, and sent Eumenes an envoy offering his old satrapy back. If Antigonus was to fight Polyperchon, he would need skilled subordinates, and no one, not even his direst foes, could deny that Eumenes had skill. Polyperchon, however, got wind of Antigonus's moves, and so he planned to outbid his opponent. Just as Eumenes was accepting Antigonus's generous proposal and was let free, Polyperchon dispatched an even more generous one. Eumenes would be granted command of the Silver Shields, a battalion of phalanx infantry famed as the most elite in the world, and what's more, he would be granted access to all the royal treasuries throughout the empire. Polyperchon, as the regent and the possessor of the two kings, was still the legitimate government of the empire, so even if he did not have de facto control, his words still carried great weight. In this way, Polyperchon hoped to tie down Antigonus in the east, while he fought Antipater's son Cassander in Europe. When Eumenes received this offer, he considered it very, very carefully. He had a good deal with Antigonus, who would surely be able to dominate the empire with Eumenes at his side. But what's the point of second place when you can go for gold? Eumenes accepted Polyperchon's offer. And just like that, Eumenes of Cardia was back in the game. <laughs>